Organizing for Positive Change. If you're watching online, you can send questions to us live. We do have a monitor. And that is the email address that you need to send it to, hccm at cfhou.com. Um, or you can go to the meetup group and post a comment there. Or you can go to YouTube and post a comment in, next to the YouTube stream as well. Either way, we have a monitor. And uh, Ed, come up and say hi. This is the official monitor guy. Hi. So that's who you're talking to. Thank you so much for doing that. Um, oh, we want to say thank you to the Nature Discovery Center. We are in the Nature Discovery Center in Houston, Texas. And it is a lovely facility that they allow us to use for a really reasonable rate. The Nature Discovery Center provides uh, children's educational programs for uh, learning about nature. So they have all sorts of displays and outdoor programs and summer programs and during school year. And so if you have kids, it's a great place to come and uh, play. Uh, www.naturediscoverycenter.org. I don't want to forget that. Okay. So you're not alone. We have an audience here in the room. Say hi, everybody. Hi. 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 <laughs> so I know that we're live streaming right now. And then uh, when we are complete, uh, YouTube processes it and posts it as a recording. So uh, you can see the recording again later. So let's talk about conquering your clutter, loving your life, which is the clutter free tagline, by the hi. way. Hi. And we are going to talk about how organizing can bring about positive change in your emotional state as well as your physical state. This is a new topic for us and we've been talking mostly about the more direct causes of clutter like not processing your mail all the time or inheriting things from your family or having more than will fit in your house. All those are sort of a direct, what I think of as really direct causes of clutter but I think that there's also a, a trigger for clutter that is based on your emotional life. So sometimes people use clutter as a way to distract themselves from emotional pain, emotional issues, things that they don't want to deal with, and it's a way to avoid. Because when think about when you have your house, when it's sort of chaos, when you can only get through with little goat trails, you're really physically boxed into place, right? And it creates an environment in which no movement is happening at all can't move forward, can't get anything done. It's a real struggle to get dressed in the morning, to wrap the birthday gift, to get through the kitchen, cook something. A lot of times the places I go into, the rooms have become unusable. So would you guys go open that door for them? Thanks. I think it's not locked. I think they're just not pushing hard enough. So the room sometimes becomes unusable. Um, and when you are surrendering function in your house, you're really giving up part of your quality of life. Well, if this physical boxing in is a reflection of your emotional state, sometimes we are creating clutter so that we don't have to deal, right? So that we can just sort of not face something. The problem with that process is, although it seems like a good plan to avoid pain for a day, it doesn't just last for the day. It lasts for as long as you keep the place chaotic. So sometimes I go into people's houses and the house has been a wreck for a decade because somebody died 10 years ago and they've never been able to process that pain. And so they sort of let the house box them into a frozen position and sort of hold it like that and try, they put a whole lot of energy in keeping it chaotic so that they don't have to face something that seems like it's going to be really, really awful to face. So sometimes clutter is a mirror of an emotional state. <clears throat> the reverse of that is sometimes decluttering can help you change that state, right? I'm going to make sure. So I'm, I'm talking about reframing how we see it, reframing how we think about it. If you are using clutter as a distraction to prevent suffering, you're putting a lot of energy into that, 
you can re-channel that energy and use that same level of energy into decluttering on the other end. So it's a way to shift your physical environment and also create effect in your emotional state. I want to make sure I'm sitting here. When we invest in keeping the house crazy, this is one last point I want to make about that. When it stays chaotic as a way to stay frozen, at some point it starts costing you more in terms of quality of life to maintain that than it does to expend the effort you're going to have to take to clean it up. When I go and clean in people's houses, we're putting a whole lot of effort into digging it out. It's a lot of work. But usually by the time I show up, people have invested a huge amount of time, years and years, in letting it build up, letting it slowly shrink their environment, letting subtracting quality of life over and over and over. It gets narrower and narrower, and you end up with the ghost trails, and you can't cook in the kitchen, and perfectly rational people lose control of their space and keep telling themselves that it's easier to live in the chaos than it is to clean it up. And I think that that's a hidden cost. It really isn't easier to live in the chaos. And the worse it gets, the harder it is to do the most basic things. So in, in the short term, it seems like, oh, that's too much effort, I'm not going to do it. But in the long term, you see the people on the hoarding shows, for instance, that are climbing over a mountain of stuff. Now, most of us don't get that far, but maybe you really have to struggle to get into your closet. Or maybe you can't find the pan that you need when you're going to cook in that pan. <coughs> or maybe you don't know where the gift is that you bought for your nephew's birthday, right? So it doesn't have to be that you're crawling over mountains like it is on television to say that you've you know, lost your quality of life. It can be impacting your quality of life just by making it harder for you to do the normal stuff that you want to do. And I think that there is a component of emotion as it's scary to face emotion and clutter boxes you in so you don't have to do it. But at some point you sort of cross that line. It's too much. It's costing you too much to keep it that way and not face the demon, not face the thing that's scaring you the most. Okay. So when we're talking about reframing it, if processing your clutter is mirroring processing your emotional baggage, cluttering is keeping it stuck, decluttering can be a way that you create change and movement, right? So while you're decluttering, you're creating a more pleasant space. The, the real obvious things are the room looks better, it's easier to live, it's better to do. But sometimes creating that really peaceful space uh, creates a shift in your mental peace. And a lot of times when I work with people and they say to me at the end, oh my gosh, I feel so calm now. I feel so peaceful now. I feel like it's not yelling at me anymore. Like the clutter's been yelling at them. Clean, 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 clean. You know? It's peaceful when you get done and it makes you feel better, not just because it's easier to physically move, but because it's a more peaceful place to exist in your brain. So if you want to think of decluttering as a way to make improvements in your mental life, maybe it seems like a burden to declutter so you can find the gifts, but maybe it's more of an incentive to declutter to help create emotional shift. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I've been having problems just like I finally decided I'm going to do something and it's like it's it's just really hard to make a, a relevant change. Like you know, three weeks ago I, I started and I was like chipping away at it and then I got sick and I was sick for like two weeks and you know you after two weeks of being sick stuff piled up. You know, and so now I'm back to probably where I start. That's always a bummer. And you probably got tripped up by a couple of things. One of which is, in addressing a clutter problem, there's always two pieces. There's the existing chaos, 
and there is the ongoing everything new coming in chaos, right? So you have to address what's going to come in the future, and you have to address what's already there. So you have to stop the flow, not shopping as much, filtering the mail, um, throwing out the trash more often, throwing out the recycling more often. You have to process the incoming stuff as an ongoing maintenance chore, as well as stop when you, if you do the ongoing maintenance, then you're left with a pile of past stuff that's sitting there that then becomes a project to do. So you may have made headway in the project, but because you were sick, you weren't able to do any maintenance on the rest, like the stuff that was coming in. So you sort of put out old and replaced it with new. So you have to do both of those at the same time. Yes, ma'am. I'm not sure it's in your jurisdiction that getting sick and making any major changes because I made a major schedule change. Last Friday, now I'm sick. <laughs> I think that there's, you know, we'll let the psychologist talk to us about that, but I do think that there's an emotional component to it. If you find change, the changes that you're making big and scary, sometimes it does affect your physical health. Sometimes it's a lot to process, and that's one of the things that happens. So Ed found a wonderful article about um, creating happiness and how happiness creates and fosters success. And what was it called, Ed? It was about the psychology of happiness. Positive psychology. There you go. Positive psychology. So it, the idea being that um, it isn't that you should try to be successful and then you'll be happy. It's that you should try to be happy and then you'll be successful. So um, we w printed a list. I'm going to read this list to you. It's five practices to help your brain become positive and support happiness. And it suggested that these five habits are proven to make humans happier and more successful. So the first one is write down three things you're grateful about. <coughs> this is something that rewires your brain <coughs> to it function, to go look for the pattern of, to scan for the pattern of positive things instead of negative. So it's trying to rewire you to go be looking for positive instead of looking for negative. And if you write down three things you're grateful for, it helps you do that. Journal about a positive sense. This lets you live that positive experience. It helps you stay in that place of enjoyment and you know, reward. Physical exercise teaches you. Physical exercise is teaching your brain that behavior matters. Meditation. This allows your brain to focus on the task at hand instead of many tasks. And you know, I have a client who's from, who's from England, and she just said to me the other day, you Americans are really, really good at the multitasking thing. And I, thought, I don't think of that as an American trait, but maybe it really is. That we Our focus really pace. hard on being really fast paced and really, you know, doing a whole lot of things so that we have to meditate so that we are only doing one thing at a time <laughs> to give our brains a little rest. Practice random acts of kindness. Mm -hmm. Their suggestion was send a supportive, positive email to every time you open your inbox to one of your uh, social support network people. So you're sending out something positive, thanking them, praising them, some kind of a positive email out to somebody every time you open your inbox. How cool would that feel? Mm -hmm. To send something nice to somebody every time you open the email? That's one of the ways that it's retraining your brain. So I thought this was a really great idea, and so we wanted to create a decluttering version of this list, a way to feel positive about decluttering. So we created the Clutter Fairies Five-Step Daily Practice to Support a Clutter life. <laughs> How's that for a title? So the first thing that I wrote down was post it, post on Meetup or YouTube every time you accomplish a clutter reducing task. Like go on the Meetup and go, hey, guess what? I threw out the, <laughs> I faced my mother's hat collection. I cleaned out the craft room, whatever. Go on there and tell us so that we can all go, woohoo, <laughs> cheer for you in community. Because I know that you guys all have known each other. A lot of you have known each other for a while now. And even if you haven't, you know everybody on the meetup group is there to talk about decluttering. So what more perfect place to get support about having accomplished one? So go on there and tell us about it. We'll, we'll cheer for you. On YouTube or on YouTube? Um, you can go on YouTube. You can go on the meetup group. Yeah, because if you go on to YouTube, 
you can post it next to the recording, or you can go to the meetup group and post it next to the meetup and say, hey, remember we were talking about yada yada, guess what I did, blah, blah. And, you know, it, go, it gets mailed out to everybody, right? So you'll get an email and somebody can, we can write you back and say, yay. So the clarifying version of the next one was take a moment to write about the experience of letting go of something or go talk to a friend about it. Sometimes people find letting go of something hard. They're throwing out their dead husband's clothes. They're giving away the 27 stuffed animals that they had from when they were a kid. You find something to be difficult to process and you're able to accomplish that task, go talk to somebody about it. Help yourself process through what comes up because you've thrown it out. Or maybe you need to talk to somebody about it before you do it so that you can have a positive experience of actually letting it go. Let them support you while you do it. The point being, look for positive support in that process. So the, the exercise equivalent is set a timer and declutter for 15 minutes every day. Or go around and do the pick up 10 exercise where you pick up 10 things that are trash and pick up 10 things for donation every day. So you're doing a short amount of, what am I, bookended, you know, I'm only going to be here for this long. I'm going to count to 10 twice and then I'm done. Or I'm going to set the timer and I'm going to do it for 15 minutes and then I'm done. But Create that routine of doing something every day in 15-minute increments. Maybe that'll help you move forward. Here's a fun one. So, um, this is the uh, meditation equivalent for the Clutter Furries uh, list. Sit still in a decluttered space for a while. So if you don't have a space like that in your house, I came up with all these great places. You can and sit in one of their prepped rooms, or you can go to a model house. Or you can go to uh, some kind of furniture store where they have, you know, layout setups of here's the living room, you know. Go sit in a room, or bedroom particularly, go sit in a nice, beautifully laid out bedroom. The and sit there. Huh? Go to the Rockman Chapel. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and sit. The idea being that you sit in a peaceful space and notice how you feel about being in a space that isn't cluttered and how that feels differently to you. Maybe you haven't had the opportunity, or in a while, haven't had the opportunity to feel what that feels like. So go park yourself in a space that you considered uncluttered, and then rest in that for a little while and feel, see how soothing and calming it feels. The last one, the random, the random act of kindness version for the Clare Furry is um, give something away as a donation, and then tell us about it. So maybe you want to find something really big and important that you want to, you're want you having trouble with and you want to donate. So donate it and then come on and go, guess what, I gave away the piano. <laughs> whatever, whatever thing that it is, come on and tell us that you made a donation to a charity that makes you feel good and we'll help you relive that experience. We will cheer you on and help you validate that you did something good today and it'll help you feel better about it. I'm hoping that the idea of a conquering clutter practice, daily practice, will be something that allows you to make forward motion. If you're feeling really stuck, it hopefully will move you along and get you started or get you going if you get derailed, for instance, like she was telling us. And if you can, if you experience a bunch of emotional distress because you're plowing through your stuff, I just want to say please, Seek help, call your professional, call your friends, wherever your support network is, and make sure that you don't do that alone. If it does, sometimes it does bring up stuff for people, and I want you to make sure that you go and get support for that and so that you can process it and move past. That's the ultimate goal here, right? We want to process and move past. So I think if you can get moving, It'll be worth it. <laughs> It'll be worth it to make that change for yourself. So I want to stop here and uh, ask questions. And I'm going to remind people in the audience that they can send me an email if they want to and ask a question, but I'm going to ask the room. Okay, and I'm going to repeat your question after you say it, so please sure, don't sure. be offended. Because <laughs> um, yeah. you're back in the back of the room. <laughs> Hi. Um, question is, I have stopped for example. Cards, you know, and I collect them, and then I, I think, oh, maybe if I do 
is immune to it, I will uh, make this. Um, and it just keeps. Are you talking about business cards? Or are you business talking about okay? That, yeah, similar. You know, that. And um, I just feel whatever I'm saying is going to be helpful in the near future or far future. Someday. Yeah. Right. So I. Um, yeah, I'm just going to, um, it's not much of a wonder, but occupy space. And I don't know where to draw a line where okay, this one is out in this one. Okay, so um, she is basically saying that she collects things, thinking they're going to be useful in the future, and she doesn't know where to find. So I think the answer to your question is, everyone has a volume at which they feel like something is manageable. And if you collect 500 business cards and that looks like chaos to you, then that's probably too much. Like maybe you want to collect 100. And then stop. So when you get a new one, you gotta throw one out. Or maybe you set up a process where once a month you flip through the cards and go, yeah, I haven't talked to that person. Yeah, I haven't talked to that person. Throw out ones that become old and stale. So it's a good idea to have a threshold against which you measure your contents. And it isn't that you've run out of space everywhere. It needs to be a smaller threshold than that. So like when the inbox is full, then you file. You don't let the inbox get two feet tall. You only let it get two inches tall. And then you stop and file. So you want to, if you don't have a big pantry, for instance, you don't want to buy 20 cases of soda because you can't stash 20 cases of soda. So you want to buy three cases of soda and wait for those to be done before you buy more. So you want to create some threshold where you feel comfortable, like you feel like you have enough but you don't have too much. And for everybody, that level is going to be a little different, right? It's going to move up and down depending on how much you pay paper and how much you, know, you refer to those things. I guess I would also filter them for if you register for how often you touch them. Do you actually go back to those cards very often? <laughs> yeah, so if you're not actually touching the collection, then you have to edit those, I think, to a smaller pile. If it's something you use all the time, it makes more sense to have more of it if you're going to be processing through it all the time. But if it's something that you're ignoring, except when you add, make it bigger, <laughs> yeah, then I think you have to let a little small pile. It could be what, I'm sorry? File or put it in a box. Either way it's filing. But Either way it's filing, but you don't want to do that endlessly because I don't want you to keep creating more and more and more files because then you're just doing work for no good reason, right? So it's important to, before you default to paper needs to be filed, it's important to evaluate whether it's important paper or not and whether it actually is worth your time. Because everything that you throw away is one less thing you have to make a file folder for, right? <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I have a question slash comment. That's okay. Something I'm struggling with. Um, one is, you were saying that uh, sometimes it's easier to live in the clutter to avoid yourself. Mm -hmm. For me, I don't know if it's easier because I look around and it's like I have a lovely home, but I'm not enjoying it. To full capacity because it's too cluttered for things. And um, for me, it's um, it, it feels almost overwhelming. Like where to start? That's one issue. And then the other okay, thing, where to start? That's issue one. And then maybe related to that is um, you know the rule about like maybe 15 minutes a day, a little bit at a time, so it doesn't seem so unmanageable. So I do a little bit of time. You know, <coughs> You know, working full time and involved in a lot of things. So you have a life. You're telling me you have a lot. Yeah, shock. So I try to do a little bit time, but then I get discouraged because I don't see a lot of tangible difference. Good point. Those are good points. Okay, so she's saying a she doesn't know where to start, right? And b she does do work, but she has a full life, and so she gets discouraged because she doesn't see tangible difference. Kind so, of like dieting, you know. Maybe yes, you it is kind of like dieting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's kind of how I feel. Well, and dieting is exactly the same thing. You have to stop the flow. 
you have to stop stem the bleeding, right? So you have to change what's coming in your body so you don't keep adding. I gained weight. I gained weight. Isn't that annoying? Like my husband died. Well, you know, but I my had, husband died, and so mm, I had this loss. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that's a perfect example of emotional trauma being reflected in your environment. But see, now you're... And I'm a therapist, and I see it. <laughs> <laughs> but I feel... Well, well, you know, it's like I have the insight and awareness, but then sometimes it's hard to, like, propel that into... Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. Well, and just because you're a therapist doesn't mean you don't get the proper amount of time to grieve. I mean, so how long has it been? It's been eight years. Okay, so now it's the time. It is. And, <laughs> and just recently, in the past year, did I find the grief and stuff. Oh, okay. And... There were things that I mailed to his family members and or donated or this or this. Yeah. So I finally done and that took years and years to be able to just emotionally. But now now it is really just me and my stuff. Right. Or, right. Um, so that's right. My too. problem is I love to shop. And it's a I big part movie. of um, just my social life with my mom and with friends. Um you can Doing you know events instead of shopping, you gotta start like going to do stuff together, movies, you know, yeah, walking. drinking coffee. You know, Actually, yeah. I, I spent some time with a girlfriend this past weekend, and she used to have some cluttering problems, and she's really made some significant changes, and that's been inspiring to me. And I told her about um, like taking some things into some resale shops because I've been doing that. It helps me thin down my closet, and also I'm earning a little side money, so that's been good. So I've been encouraging her to do that. So she was drawing on a number of things, and she trusts my judgment. I was giving her some feedback. Keep this. Donate that. That needs to be repaired. And so I did that a few hours, and she's like, and I'll do that with you. But it, she's been ever to my house, but I don't feel ready to have someone start going <laughs> through stuff like that. I mean, because yeah. she's a lot more pared down, so we could say, okay, we're just going to tackle yeah, this space. Yeah, yeah. So I think I have her as a resource, but I'm not quite ready for her to come in I in a similar place. Well, and I think that what you're what you're really saying here is you need to do it in small enough bites to be manageable. I mean, you do have to adjust your concept of I'm not doing it fast enough. It is a if you do it in small bites, it's resolved in small over a longer period of time. Like there's the, you know, there's the surgical version where you go in and you work until you drop and there's then you work so hard or you do it in little pieces of time work into your life and you make incremental progress over time and I so, do remember you saying I'm sorry that's okay. I do remember you saying that I mean this happened for <coughs> a number of years so it's not going to change overnight exactly it's kind of like <coughs> you wait every number of years you have to make yeah and you can't you know take yeah process. exactly so I tried to remind myself of that and that was really helpful that you said that but I understand but you getting frustrated. frustrated. Yeah. Well, and you have to think that too that the being frustrated is a positive result as well because it means that you're noticing it, right? Instead of not noticing and not caring, now you do care, and you are so that's moving down the the pendulum a little bit. You know, you're running down the track because two years ago you might not have noticed or cared or been motivated at all, and now you're motivated. You're doing stuff, and you're getting irritated that. It's not fixing fast enough, right? That's a good sign. That means that you're looking for the end result. So I would do, again, the two things. You have to stem the flow. Like you have to stop what's coming in as a maintenance thing. And then you have to put in time against the old stuff. So I would set separate times for each. You see what I'm saying? So you're going to put time in on maintenance, and you're going to put time in on the project, the leftovers. And hopefully that will help you. And then, you know, you can do your 15 minutes in between, but maybe you want to add one Sunday a month I'm going to spend an afternoon and, and try to make a big dent. And then I thought of too was um, when I'm working with people in their houses and I go in and they're like, where do we start? I'm like, what's making you the most mad? What ticks you off the most? Does it tick you off every morning when you go in your closet and you can't get dressed and you're always late for work? Does it really aggravate you that you can't get into the kitchen every night and cook dinner? So whichever one, you know, pick what is the biggest irritation to you and start with that. Because if you fix that for yourself, it'll be better for you every day. 
and you won't be angry. That piece of anger will <laughs> about the clutter will go away every day, and it will be a positive reinforcement up front. You know, work on the stuff in descending order of irritation. <laughs> And you know, I, I, that's one way to do it. The other way is you work on the oldest stuff first, right? And and then work to the stuff that's newer. So it's really a function of if the oldest stuff isn't getting you, isn't affecting your environment fast enough to make you happy, maybe you don't want to do it that way and you want to go work on what's most irritating first. Whichever way gets you there. Ah, I'm being prompted to remind you about here's the email address. In order to send questions to Ed, he's patiently waiting for them. Who else had a question? Do you have a question? Somebody that was you had a question. But I was okay. just going to say what you just said. It was what you told her earlier. You got to almost simultaneously mm -hmm. create a system to to do something differently about the incoming stuff while you're working with the system. It's true. Mm -hmm. And if you are just completely starting from scratch, you haven't done anything. Else, then it just really doesn't matter where you just have to get started. You just have to practice the work, practice those muscles that get you moving along. And in, in deference to today's topic, I think the biggest issue for people getting started is they're having fear about what's going to happen when they touch mom's stuff. And usually the fear is much bigger than the actual event. Like when you dig in and you think, oh God, that's all mom stuff. I just can't face it. I hear that a lot. <coughs> and then we go to start working on it and we pull up, okay, what, here's these clothes. We're going to go through these clothes. Or here's this mail. We're going to go through these mail. It might be disturbing or distressing a little, but it's not nearly as bad. You know, it's just like any other project. Dread it and dread it and procrastinate and procrastinate and procrastinate because you're sure it's going to be the most miserable thing ever. And then when you finally make yourself do it because you have a gun to your head and somebody's going to die if you don't, it's not that hard. It's not as terrible as you've been pumping yourself up that it is. So clutter is the same way. People assume that touching the stuff is going to make them hysterical, miserable, and fall apart. But it's not usually as bad as that. It is sometimes sad and a little traumatic depending mm -hmm. on where they are in the process and how they feel about it. Um, I have a client whose father was kidnapped and killed and she still has problems talking about her dad and processing. You know, was very, she was young and it was really traumatic and awful. But she's been able to make shifts over time. So after a couple of years of working with me, she now goes and opens her own mail. It was a big step for her to be able to go from, I can't look at it, there's too much going on in there, it's too overwhelming to, I'm going to pick up the mail and I'm going to put it in the same place every day and now I'm going to open it. So she has a daily maintenance system that she's been able to absorb over time. So even somebody who is severely traumatized and had a whole bunch of health issues and all other stuff going on, even she was able to, over a long period of time, make shift in her daily maintenance. She was able to make changes and it has helped her Life. She feels better. Are you raising your hand? I am. Okay. And, and please fit. my hair. <laughs> <laughs> I'm multitasking. <laughs> Excellent. Along the same lines that you're suggesting, I read a quotation the other day, which was, um, imagine that you've already made the decision. What would your life be like now? Exactly. And I thought that was uh, quite worthwhile. And that's the, that's the uh, mental version of go sit on the couch in a decluttered space and see what it's like. Right? Go and help your, help your brain process how it would feel to be on the other side of, of that project of a crazy house. And thinking about that, I thought, all right, I already have a gut feeling of how I'm going to feel when this is all cleaned out, or this part of my life, is, this baggage is gone, or whatever. Yeah. And so I think somewhere deep inside we know how it's going to feel, that ultimately it's going to feel good, mm -hmm. or we probably wouldn't be wanting to get rid of it in the first place. You know, exactly. if it already felt good. Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, I hear from clients a lot. It's very interesting to me. Sometimes I go to work with people, and they say to me, I can't do A, fill in the blank, until 
I do B fill in the blank. But then they can never actually do B fill in the blank. Like they can't do A. And usually when I start to talk to them about it, I can see a way for them to get around that and make headway on doing A. But usually as I have that conversation with them, when somebody starts with, I can't do A until I do B. And I can't do B because fill in the blank. When I start having those conversations with people, usually they kind of panic that I'm creating a solution for them. And they sort of like, no, 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 can't do that. And it's like I can perfectly well see a way that you can do C and skip B and do A and be done. And they're like, no, 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 can't do that. Can't do A until I do B. And so I have to walk away. I have to back up because they, they're not willing to accept solution. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a blocking mechanism that people do to not make shifts and changes in their life. And that's how it sounds sometimes. I can't move the piano until I get rid of the computer. I can't do the computer until that. And it, so in other words, I can do nothing. And then I start coming up with solutions and they're like, no, 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 no. And the truth is, I think that all that moving has some emotional um, re result to them. Well, you know, you either wait till you're ready, or we talk about it longer. <laughs> Hopefully, I can talk you into it. <laughs> yes, ma'am. You know, you ever heard the story of the man who thought, before I walk across the room, I have to walk halfway across the room. Before I walk halfway, I have to walk half that way. Before I walk half that way, on and on. He just sat there. I don't think he didn't get started. <laughs> <laughs> That's a perfect discussion of that. Absolutely. <laughs> you had your hand up? Yeah. Uh, it's like sometimes I have difficulty making a decision. So I keep it, but throw it away, throw it away, whatever. You know, what, what do I do with it? I mean, it's like sometimes I can just literally either make myself sick, throw myself into a tizzy. It's like I just, you know, I start going back and forth so much I literally yeah, start spinning. That's not good. Throwing yourself in a tizzy about a decision. Not good. Yeah. Mm -mm. And I don't know what to have. Do I stop it or do I just like create a new pile of I'll think about that later? The Scarlet O'Hara pile? <laughs> well, and there is a there is a process of doing decluttering that a lot of people try to decide as they touch everything where it's going to go and how it's going to be. Yeah. Instead of going through and sorting everything first and getting rid of the stuff that they're willing to get rid of. And if you try to make decisions about where is this going to go, how am I going to use it, and you can't get past that decision, then you can't see the trash and throw the trash out and see the donations and throw the donations out. I think it, it's important for people who, and particularly if you find that whole process of making the decision, a hang up, sort everything first. Don't make any decisions. Just sort it. And here's the pile of scissors, and here's the pile of paper, and here's the pile of fill in the blank, blankets. And then go back to all the scissors and go, gee, there's 35 pairs of scissors here. Perhaps I only need to keep two. It'll make the decision easier because you can compare against the whole population and you don't feel like you're cutting off all of your options. You're picking the best five or three or seven or whatever. The initial decision is not yeah, and don't, permanent. Yeah, don't, it's not a permanent one. And here's the other thing, too. People make decisions like they don't live in 21st century Houston. Like, if you throw out a pair of scissors that you're going to have to get in the buggy and go, you know, 30 miles to town to get a pair of scissors. No. You're going to get up at midnight and go to the CBS down the block and surprise, there'll be a scissors. So not life changing. Yeah. So if you, even if you throw it away and you're irritated that you have to buy it again, I just want you to say to yourself, but if I had all this stuff here, I wouldn't be able to find it anyway. I'd still be buying it again. So if you throw away 70% and then you regret one thing later, it's just the cost of living in a clutter-free house. And if you have to buy one out of 70 again, that 20 bucks will be worth it. I defy you to throw out something that's worth $500 that's going to make your heart bleed that you have to buy it again. You're going to be talking about the, the $5 post-its and the, you know, it's not it, the, the shirt maybe. You know, that's going to cost you 35 bucks or 
50 bucks instead of, you know. So the decision making is not permanent, it's not life threatening, it is the 21st century, it's Houston. And there is a store open 24 hours somewhere in the city that you can get whatever you need, whenever you need it, I swear to God. And, you know, if you're looking at 2 o'clock in the morning and you can't find somebody, you call me on the phone and say, I can't find a blah, 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 and I will tell you where to go. So don't be worried about it, okay? It is possible to solve that problem. Don't you say that I think most, most of the time that I do that, I'm not trying to make a decision. Like, A, am I going to keep it and get rid of it? And B, where am I going to put it? And you know, that blah, 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 blah. A whole bunch of decisions that go with it. Right. So I'm saying that the shorter, faster path is to sort it first and make keep toss decisions only. Don't worry about the stuff that you're going to keep. Don't worry about where it's going to go or how you're going to use it or nothing. All you want to do is, is it staying in the house? Is it not staying in the house? Because then you're going to cut down your contents by half. And then the amount of things you have to make decisions about just shrunk by 50%. So all the ones that are going in the trash and going to recycle and going to donation, they go out of the house and you don't have to decide nothing about them. So don't make yourself crazy trying to decide about it all. Okay? Does that help? Yes. One question. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Uh, is it true when they say, well, if you haven't touched the pair of pants for, say, a year or two, you get rid of it, or even longer? Uh, because I have kept, and I have probably do, and enjoyed it, and then put it away, and then I haven't seen it for like, five, ten years. But that's there. But it's still there, waiting for you patiently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Fashion comes and comes and goes. <laughs> well, here's the thing about clothes. You know, I, how do you sell these clothes? Clothes are the downfall of every woman, okay? They all have too many clothes. Even if they only have four shirts, it's probably more than they need, right? It's clothes. We keep clothes. And we keep clothes that we wore in high school like we're going to wear them when we're 60, except no person stays the same size and weight that they were in high school. If that's a lie that they tell you. But your body's going to stay like it was when it was 16. They act like 16 is the end game, and then you spend the rest of your life trying to be 16. Guess what? Not going to happen. I don't care what you do. Um, so, you know, those jeans you wore when you were 16, you're not going to be wearing them when you're 60. And the truth is, it all, everyone's collection has to be defined by the closet space you have. <laughs> so, if you don't have closets for it, you're keeping too much. You may want to have a thousand pieces, but if you only have closet space for 300 pieces, that's what you should be keeping. Because if you keep a thousand pieces and try to cram them into a space for 300 pieces, then you can't get to them anyway. You can't use the ones you have. It doesn't matter how much you have. You can't see three quarters of it. So the closet needs to have some air in it. You need to be able to walk into it. You need to be able to find what you want. You need to be able to hang up stuff that comes out of the dryer. It can't be hard. If it's hard, you have too many clothes. That's the bottom line. You have too many clothes for a peaceful life. If you are, you know, a clothes person, it's your thing. You're into clothes. Fashion's your thing then, you know, A, you need to have a space that has been a closet for it. And you still need to try to regulate based on the closet space. And, you know, add more furniture. <coughs> if, if you have dressers and things to put things in, and you, at some point it's going to be, no matter what you do, you're still going to reach capacity. The house, the closet, they all have permanent walls. Mm -hmm. It's not growing rooms. The closet is not going off into infinity. So at some point you have to declare the collection complete, and then you you know you put in new stuff and you take out old stuff, and and you're basically making a, a pact with yourself. I need to buy new clothes because I think that's fun or hip or cool, which means that in order to keep the new stuff, I gotta let the old stuff go to you know someone else, because it's more important for me to play with the new ones than to keep the old ones, right? So you just make that choice. It's I'm I'm spending. To, I clearly have enough clothes in my closet to stay clothed and not be arrested. So um, I'm only buying them for my entertainment now, and because I want to be fashion trendy. So if I if I want to if fashion trendy is the goal, then you keep the new stuff, you let the old stuff go. That's the bottom line. Yes, ma'am. I, I think that's. Did that help? Was that, I'm sorry. Maybe. Okay. Good. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Even a better measure than that thing they say about the six month or one year rule. I, I, I go through my stuff pretty often, but there are things I have. 
could say like some holiday things. And I've got some things, if it's cold during the holidays, I can wear them. And I've only had them for a couple of years. But if I did the six month rule or the one year rule, I would have thrown them away. Well, yeah. But I will wear them again next, you know, next it's Christmas cold or whatever. Next Christmas. Well, and Houston yeah. has winter, summer, right? So in other places, they have to change their clothes out, you know, four times. Because it shifts, the temperature is shifting. In Houston, you bring out the winter clothes, you see them for about two months, you might wear each thing one time, and then you put them away again because it's too hot, right? So we trade winter and summer in the closet, and you put the winter stuff away. Like, there's no way in July the winter stuff is going to be useful at all. So it goes in the closet. And the six-month rule is really just a, it's like, how do you draw a parameter when you don't know what the parameter is? I'm saying that the better parameter is, does it fit in your closet? Can you wear it? Do you still like it? I'm saying I agree. Yeah, and I, and, yeah, and you know, and the, and the Christmas, the holiday, the winter gear, in our environment, that should be a small, I coach people that should be a really small part of their closet. And I know people that come from up north, they move here and they're like, oh, I can't. No, I've got 400 sweaters. Sister, those are never coming out of storage. I'm sorry. That ain't happening. You think you brought those 80 sweaters, they're never going to see the light of day again. I'm sorry. You know, they have a bunch of wool. Come on! Nobody's wearing a wool sweater in this, in this environment. No way. We'll be lucky if it get close to freezing, right? So the cotton sweater and your coat and you're done. The scarf, you wear the scarf five times and it goes back in the closet. So this much, right? So you keep those populations commensurate with how often you use them, right? That's close. Who else? Yeah? Do you have something? You have that look on your face. Uh, well, I was just thinking about one little solution I had. I don't know if I ever told anybody about this. I had it right now. Okay, this is your solution. Okay. So I, I write down things I own. It's on paper, so it helps me then. If it does go out the door, a list of what it is, and maybe even the brand name. It just is something I do. You make a list of things that you're giving away. I do that, or if I own it now, and then later I can give it away without messing up with the list. Is there. <laughs> and it's recorded. It's in my in my paper. So it's crazy. you're keeping the list of things you've donated, and that helps you because yeah, I'm just donated, but even the things I keep. So that any time, so you're basically keeping the list of everything you buy. Inventory, right? Inventory, okay. okay. But before it would ever leave the house, I would write it down. It goes out. It just helps me to own it without it being. Oh, different. that's interesting. <laughs> that's like the. Version of taking a picture of it. Well, I tried that one time, and I didn't want to go down. So I did. Okay, so instead of taking a picture of the things she's rid of, she's writing down on a list that she used to own X Y Z, and then she can give it away, and it's on the list, and that makes her feel like she still owns it. That's great. I love that. I'm sure that's really the written equivalent of taking a picture. It's, it's like a store with you all right. And how many I have and how many. Just, it takes two lines of yeah, yeah, yeah. Very clever. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> I like that idea. That's a good one. Who else has a question? <coughs> Anybody struggling? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Mine have not really been motivated to. do things like during the commercial and it's really not enough time to do much you know <laughs> like I'll hang up like two things during a, the commercial break or whatever you know so at the end of the show I can say oh that was 15 minutes and it was you know but um, and I know that's probably not prime time to do it that way but that's helping me get a little bit tough. It doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah totally. Do like, we, we, don't have, yeah. we don't have quality judgments about it. You're still putting the time in. You, you know, yeah, you're, if you're focused and unfocused for, you know, you're focused for two minutes and then you're unfocused again, it's, you know, there's sort of that, uh, you're diminishing your capacity by starting and stopping a lot. But, you know, so what? Who cares? It's your house and it's your stuff. So if you are 
spending your time and making something happen is better than zero. <coughs> it's better than being completely stuck. Yes? Uh, this is along the same lines as the quotation. And I think I'm going to post this for everybody because it's been really helpful to me. Um, if it isn't useful, beautiful, or enjoyable, or no, it isn't useful, beautiful, or joyful, get rid of it. Oh, that's a good one. If it isn't useful, beautiful, beautiful. or joyful, get rid of it. And all of these things are all of these things are just ways. All of these things are just ways to give yourself the parameters to let it go. So anything that helps you let something disappear is a good thing. Yes, ma'am. How about this quote? Someday is not a day of the week. <laughs> <laughs> Sunday is not day of the week, and that's why getting started in any way that you can is is a good start. Whatever, if you're like I said, if if it's making you the craziest, you can start with what's making me the most aggravated. You can start with what is the easiest. You can start with I'm going to stay in one room. It doesn't matter what path you follow to get there. Just do whatever you can to get started. And if you have trouble, go on the meetup group and say, ah, I'm having trouble. I can't, la, 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 la. And let us answer you. Let us support you. Let us try to make a difference and help you get off square one because we don't want you to stay there. I want you to have a better life. I want you to feel like you have quality of life in your space. I want you to love your things and love your space and be happy and stress-free about it. That's the goal. That's why you come here. We want to help you do that. So please make your comments. And let us cheer you on and keep coming back. Are we done? I think we're done. You guys have anything else? Okay. Thank you so much for coming. I'm going to end the broadcast. Do I need to say anything else?